Well, thank you for the introduction, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to, um, to be speaking here. But it's a somewhat sad occasion because we're commemorating the loss of our colleague and friend Jan Nekovar. And I learned a great deal from, uh, from Jan, and it was always a, a great pleasure to speak to him because there are some mathematicians who have a very clear idea of what's happening at the moment and the current trends in mathematics. But Jan was always one who would try and predict what, the, what would be important in mathematics in five or ten years' time and try and anticipate things and provide the tools that the next generation of mathematicians would need. And that's something I very much admired in Jan's work and I think we can all try and learn from. So I'll mention, as I go, in th as I go, go on in this talk, some points where, where uh, Jan's work uh, were relevant and necessary in ways that maybe he could never have, have precisely predicted. Um, anyway, so the topic of this is a very old problem. So it was our theory, the adjoint of a modular form. And I'll just set the scene by talking about the general conjectures of Iwasawa theory and what we hope to, to prove. The main conjectures in Euler systems. That doesn't go any higher up. Okay. So I'm going to take V to be a geometric theatic representation. of the absolute Galois group of Q. And attached to this, I have an L function. Which, if this thing comes from a motive, is at least well behaved. And we assume that L V zero is a critical value. And we also assume that V is ordinary at P. Or we can assume something slightly weaker, which is the Dabrowski Panchishkin condition. This is saying the Galois group at P preserves a full flag. This is just saying that it pres preserves a certain subspace of a specific size, which is enough. But uh, if you want, it's simply to assume the stronger condition of being ordinary. And the point of this condition is it should be the correct one for a p adic L function to exist. So I'm going to define this over the cyclotomic ZP extension. So gamma is going to be the Galois group. Q infinity over Q. That's more fit to ZP. When you say it should be the correct one, you mean that something like final point triangle line would be unique? And um, for the, f as I f am going to formulate it, the dabrowski fanchishkin condition should be the correct one. Because in about five symbols time, I'm going to, to write the word measure. So under these hypotheses, we expect that there should be a piadic L function, which is a measure on gamma LP of V Let me put the board down here it should be visible for everyone So we're all finite ca order characters chi of gamma I take LP of V and I evaluate it at chi, I should get the 
algebraic part of a complex alpha value. So it should be L of V times chi to the minus 1, 0 divided by a period. And there's some explicit fudge factor. I'm not going to spell out, but it's spelled out in detail in the original papers. So this guy is interpolating, in a precise sense, the, um, the L values of all of the twists of V by finite order characters divided by appropriate periods. What is the rationality property of the right-hand side? Um, in this setting, this is going to be an equality of two, um, of two algebraic numbers, where this is a particular... This, this is a p-adic function, but at this particular point, its value is algebraic. And this, again, is a, an algebraic value of a complex function. So you have to fix some isomorphism between the two parts. OK, fair enough. I'm going to fix an embedding of q-bar into q-p-bar henceforth. So, yes, I should have done that at the beginning. Thank you for keeping me honest. So we conjecture that this thing should be, uh, that this thing should be related to an algebraic object. So this analytically defined measure should be related to a Selma group. So I'm going to take T inside V, a, a lattice, a stable under the Galois group, it's implicit. And we define this, the Selma group by a recipe involving duality. So it's It's the Bloccato finite part of the cohomology of the Tate dual so the, This is Pontryagin Pontri duality here and this is a finitely generated module over the algebra of measures on gap. So the USR and main conjecture for V is the statement that this guy measures the size of this guy. So LP of V generates the characteristic ideal x of q infinity t. So you have to be careful about which lattice you're working with here. As I've written it, it's not obvious that this is independent of the choice of t. But uh, in practice, for most of the representations we care about, the t is unique up to scaling anyway, and then it is well defined. Can so you recall what is ordinary? You said before very fast, what is ordinary at p? Yeah. So ordinary. The Galois group at P preserves a flag. With Hodge Tate weights in ascending order. And the Panchishkin condition, as I said, is a relaxation of this where you ask for a partial flag to be preserved. Uh, yes, so without that, you don't expect to, to have a measure or anything quite as nice as this. You expect unbounded distributions, etc. And then you have to work out what goes on the algebraic side. And there is a, a whole theory there. I'm not writing down the most general form of this, but only a, a representative example that covers the cases I want to discuss. So 
Euler systems are a tool for attacking this conjecture. So an Euler system for V, as above, is going to be a collection of classes CM in H1 of, um, of T, so some fixed lattice, but over varying cyclotomic fields. So it's very important that you, contr that you control the denominators uniformly with respect to m. You can't have different t's for it as m varies. And these have to satisfy a norm compatibility relation. So I'm not going to, well, no, I will spell it out quick in detail because we do need it. So if n is a prime and you take your, the class over the cyclotomic field of, of degree ml and then you norm it down to the one of uh, 2 q mu m, And if your prime is ramified or it divides m, then, you, then nothing interesting happens and you just ask that the norm down is the class you had before. And in the more general case, You ask that it be an Euler factor acting on that guy, where PL of X is the Euler factor. And V at L. So this is a very pre precise structure. It's not obvious whether it occurs in uh, whether it's a natural thing to expect, but these guys do seem to occur regularly in nature. And why do we care about them? It's because this theorem, due to many people, but I hope I've, I've uh, mentioned the more important contributors here. Whenever I gave talks on this, um, Jan always used to tell me I'd got the history wrong and I'd left out some name or other I should have included. So I hope I've... Uh, I hope I've not left anyone out this time. <laughs> Finally learned my lesson from Jan. <coughs> so if an Euler system exists for V, with the bottom class C1 not zero, and we have some other technical conditions notably a condition on, on the image of the Galois representation. So the Galois action needs to be sufficiently non-trivial. Then we get bounds on this x infinity. So x of q infinity. So the precise form of the bounds is uh, depends exactly on what you want to assume. So I'll give a sort of Im impressionistic sketch. I don't want to do this too precisely to avoid getting derailed. So if we let um, C Iwasawa be the image of 
of some Euler system C in the cohomology over the cyclotomic ZP extension, we have a map, which is Penner and Ryu's regulator map, which goes from this, this limit, roughly to lambda of gamma. I mean, actually it lands in some module over this and I'm trivialising it by picking a basis, but roughly it's this, and we expect that there exists an Euler system C such that if I take the Iwasawa part of C and plug it into this regulator map, it should be equal to the periodic L function of V. And when you have that, you can then deduce one inclusion. in the main conjecture. So you can deduce that the periodic L function is in the characteristic ideal. And you need different methods to, um, to prove the opposite divisibility. Do you need C1 to be non-zero in the theorem, or the, Ibazawa, the C Ibazawa should be non-zero? Um, For the bound on the Ibazawa theoretic cybergroup, maybe you just need at some point on the tower to have something which is not zero. Um, yes, it would be enough to have that C was R was not zero, but um, that is surely implied by this. Yeah. Because um, yeah, because at least for all the interesting cases, T is going to be ramified at P, and then there's, there's no Euler factors at P. So non-vanishing of, of C1 implies non-vanishing of C was R. So when you say characteristic ideal, you assume the module is torsion, or is it non? Or and I'm going. I'm defining the characteristic ideal to be zero for non-torsion modules, which is a common convention. Okay. So, of course, in practice, um, we have analytic non-vanishing results, which are going to say that the analytic periodic L function is non-zero, and so. Having shown that this is in the characteristic ideal, you've shown that characteristic ideal is non-zero. So torsionness of the Selma group is part of the conclusion. But um, you need some input somehow from complex analysis to prove that this is non-zero to deduce the, the torsionness. Yeah, so there are many um, settings now where this program has been carried out. So, so Carto published in 2004, although most of it was earlier. So he carried this out for modular forms. So taking V to be the two-dimensional representation arising from a modular form, he produced an Euler system with this property and used it to uh, deduce one half of the main conjecture. So we want to look at the the symmetric square case. So we're going to take V to be the trace zero part of the adjoint and of the representation attached to an elliptic curve over Q. So these are the trace zero endomorphisms of, um, of VPE, so this is three-dimensional. And this is isomorphic to the symmetric square of VPE twisted by minus one. And there are lots of reasons to care about this. Firstly, it's a naturally arising Galois representation. But there's a, a more subtle reason, which is that the Galois cohomology of, of, the, of this V is very closely related to deformation theory.
and thus to modularity lifting. So understanding what the, what the Selma groups of this V look like was a very crucial step in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. These Selma groups are extremely interesting and important. And just to give a little bit of history, Coates and Schmidt showed that a p-adic L function exists for this V with the correct interpolation property. And Flach, 1992, find some kind of partial Euler system, which was strong enough to give finiteness of the Selma group over Q, but not really very much else. Well, let me put T there, because then it's... Interesting to say that it's finite. So you want to be able to put the divisible version of this and then you get a finite group and you, there's an exact conjecture for its order and Flack was able to control the exponent of this group but not its order. So he didn't get the precise inf information that was uh, that one might like, and there's no information over the tower Q, inf Q infinity. And Wiles' first attempt to prove Fermat involved constructing a full Euler system in this context. And that's, as the, uh, as the historical dramatizations of this uh, tell us, and uh, turned out to to come apart in a, for a subtle and for, for a subtle reason that looked like it would demolish the proof and other another attempt an, another method was found but it doesn't resolve these two questions which having an, a full Euler system would resolve so partial means what exactly it means the normal relations were not known uh, it means that there were only classes over a, a subset of the of the possible fields i mean we can discuss this later, but it, I, I don't want to go into exactly how it doesn't match up to the, um, to the definition I put there. So can we revisit this problem and construct an Euler system for V? Well, that's the, the problem that I'm going to be discussing today, and I'm going to announce one, one way of solving this problem, not the only way, but a way that does seem to work. And I'll first describe an attempt that doesn't work, and why it doesn't work. Now I've actually got to the point where I'll be presenting some theorems. I should say that everything from here onwards. Well, let me just put the title. So there's a. Th so this is. Um, simultaneous joint work by myself, Antonio Ley and Sarah Zervas, and Bertolini, this was circa 20, 2015.
So if you take any two modular forms and you tensor together their Galois representations, we can construct an, an Euler system for that tensor product. And you can put in any twist. That's not hard to do. But uh, it just allows me to match it up with the minus one on the board over there. And so this gives a construction of an Euler system for this four-dimensional representation. And you can take f equals g, if you like. And in this case, the tensor square is isomorphic to the symmetric square. And if f is associated to e, then this is our v twisted by 1, and this is just a copy of the uh, uh, just the the one dimensional um, cyclotomic character. David, in the theorem, F and G, they're cusp forms, aren't they? Uh, yes, they're cusp forms. They're weight uh, at least two. Uh, well, you can get weight one by uh, analytic continuation as well, but they should be cusp forms. Yes. So these are cuspidal. Um, normalized eigenforms, things you can attach to a reasonable Galois representation to. I mean, you could prove a version of this for Eisenstein series as well, but you'd just be taking direct sums of copies of Cato's work. So in this, in this situation, we have the representation we want, and we have some junk piece. And we can show that, depending on the on the sign of, depending on the parity of J, runs in the sim squared factor if J is odd, and the determinant factor if J is even. So you can show that, that the projections in the other cases, have to be zero. So the, the, not only does this Euler system project trivially to the pieces of wrong parity, but in fact there exists no Euler system, no non-zero Euler system for, the, for these other factors. So this is in, not so difficult to check. So can we just say, let's project these classes into the sim square, and that's an Euler system of the sim square. And it doesn't work because of the following evil trap. So the definition of an Euler system involves so the Euler factors and the projection to the sim squared piece so so what we get is that the norm of the of the class of um, of conductor Lm is equal to the um, Euler factor we uh, we expect for the sim squared times there's something like L to the J or something here. I can't Maybe I should mean L to the minus J, but it's not so important. So this is the degree 3 Euler factor we want, and this is the junk term coming from the other factor in the larger representation that, we, that our classes start in their lives. And this is fatal. <laughs> and when you use an Euler system to bound, uh, to bound Selma groups, you always choose L to be very highly congruent to 1 mod P.
and you choose um, and, and you project into a quotient where the, where the action of the Frobenius is also um, very, very close to being trivial. So basically, this, this factor ends up being zero in the quotients that you study. So this just completely destroys the whole Selma group bounding machine. So what you can do with this method, you can prove bounds for, uh, for the Selma groups t twisted by a Dirichlet character as long as the character is sufficiently non-trivial. But chi equals one just will not work. So this was a paper Sarah and I wrote at the time, just sort of salvaging everything we could from the disappointments that we couldn't get at the Selma groups that were relevant for uh, modularity lifting and Fermat. So that was attempt one, and that's why it doesn't work. So here's another construction that might initially seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with symmetric squares of, of modular forms or elliptic curves at all. So I'm going to take F to be a real quadratic field. And curly F to be a Hilbert modular form. Automorphic form for GL2 over F. As usual, I want this to be cuspidal. And then we have two L functions. F. One of which is more familiar, and that's the one I'm not going to work with. And then another one, which is perhaps less so. Terrible term. So the somehow obvious L function, you just sum over all of the coefficients at all integral ideals of the, of the field. And there's another one, which is called the Assi L function, where you take a kind of subsum. You throw, you just look at the ideals that are coming from ideals of uh, of the uh, of the ordinary integers. And because we're in France, I probably have to specify that n, that n starts at 1. So these are two completely different L functions associated to the same, um, to the same automorphic representation. You can think of them as coming from two different representations of the, uh, of the uh, Langlands L group of the restriction of scalars of GL2. And I'm going to look at the Assi representation, the Assi L function, which is perhaps a little less familiar. And this corresponds to a four dimensional representation of the Galois group of Q, which is the tensor induction of the two dimensional. Uh, GF representation attached to F. And this thing is uh, useful and important 
largely because this is the representation that appears in the Atal cohomology of the, of the Hilbert modular, for, modular surface. So if you try and naively imitate the definition of the construction of Galois representations attached to elliptic modular forms, you might think you're going to get the L function, the, the Galois representation attached to this L function, but what you actually get is the one attached to this one. And you have to try a bit harder to get the two-dimensional thing that this is the tensor induction of. So there exists an Euler system for these assi representations for, um, for any f. I guess I want f to be uh, cuspidal at any weights bigger than or equal to 2. And I want the weight to be paritious, which is condition one always ends up carrying around in this theory. This can probably be relaxed, but we didn't bother to try too hard. So this is, in a sense, a, a rather straightforward variation on the definition of the rankin selberg Euler system. But what's much harder is a relation to periodic out functions. So even constructing the piadic L function in this case is much, much harder than it is in the rankin selberg case. And the real problem is that the integral formula giving the L values it involves H1 of coherent sheaves on a compactified modular surface. Now I want to kind of drag these, the, this integral formula into a world where we can periodically interpolate. And unfortunately, our periodic methods for understanding coherent cohomology tend to only only be only work straightforwardly either for the bottom or the top degree and this is the middle degree so heater theory <coughs> periodically interpolates h naught And by duality, if you can get at h0, you can also get at the top degree cohomology. But this is the middle degree, and there's no sensible way of, of getting at this. In the rankin selberg case, you can take one thing in the top degree and one thing in the bottom, and tensor them together. But here we have no such structure. So it was, it was only much, much later that higher heater theory came along. Which was originally developed by Piloni. And then in this particular case of Hilbert modular varieties was uh, worked out in much in in this case by 
my Giardi Grossi, who's going to be my co-author on the next few things I'm going to write down. And this gets at the H1. So earlier this year, we were able to use this to construct a periodic SIL function and slightly later we were um, we proved a relation between sorry I'm saying this the wrong way we need a, we've proved a link between the Euler system classes to this L function. So this is not quite as strong as we would like, but there will be a, there is a second paper in the works where we will strengthen this result, these results to the point where we can uh, start proving um, some um, implications towards the main conjecture. So this is really stuff that could not have been done two or three years ago because it relies crucially on this new innovation in periodic modular forms, namely higher heater theory. So why am I telling you all this? We started out with symmetric squares, and now I've started talking about these assay representations for Hilbert modular forms. And it turns out this is going to, um, to help us escape from this horrible trap about vanishing of parasitic extra Euler factors that we had on, on that board over there. So if we have F and the classical modular form attached to our elliptic curve over Q, we can take curly F to be the base change of F to a Hilbert modular form. And then you can ask, what does the assay representation of this thing look like? Sorry, I mean V assay. Right. And I want you to have in mind this decomposition. We have an analogous decomposition of this four-dimensional thing. With the same three-dimensional piece we had over there. With the crucial vital difference that the one-dimensional piece gets twisted by the quadratic character attached to our, to our field F. So now we can play exactly the same game as before. We can take our Euler system, we can project it into the sim squared piece, but now the parasitic uh, extra term is 1 minus epsilon f of L, L to the minus j from L to the minus 1. And we're going to choose L to be inert in F. And we can do this. The primes inert in F are a sufficiently thick set that you can do Euler system arguments. And that means that this is minus 1. And so this thing is no longer going to be, um, to be highly congruent to 0 mod p. It'll actually be highly congruent to 2 mod p. So it's invertible. So we can get rid of this horrible... Um, 
parasitic factor and produce an Euler system for the symmetric square. So M is restricted to products of inert primes. But that's, uh, that, minor, that doesn't get in the way when you want to use this to bound Selma groups. So P is odd? Um, well, P is odd or, you've give away a, you, or you give away a factor of two in the, um, in the Selma bounding, which is not a problem. Um, so all of this is very nice, but you have to, to ask what's going on with the L function. So we want to, we, this will give us a bound for a Selma group in terms of the, the parent view regulator of our, um, of our Euler system, which is still going to be related to the Assi L function. So what is the Assi L function of the base change of f? So we expect a factorization corresponding to that one. So we expect this to be equal to LP of sim squared of f. So there's a shift in the variable in this thing because there's the power of the uh, cyclotomic character. And the problem is that this is by no means obvious. You can't just get this by, proving, by comparing critical values. Because this has some critical values and this has some critical values, but there are no values that are critical for both. So the factorization is highly non obvious. <coughs> but there is a very clever trick by Dasgupta. which it proves the analogous result for the rankin selbo case. And this should work here as well. And this is work that um, is in progress in a slightly slu sluggish sense and hopefully might get... Um, uh, m might be making some more real, real progress on this this week since other people seem to be interested in um, looking at this too and it might actually start moving. But yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly a result that's accessible. And if I can assume it for the time being, then you get the, the, the then running the Euler system machine on this, You get that. Um, let, me, let me put this a different way. You get the characteristic ideal divides <coughs> in, in this case, K, um, K is two, so it's just S minus one. And now the only thing in this formula that depends on the real quadratic field is this p adic Dirichlet L function term. And we use this lovely theorem by a guy called Dong Ho Bion. If I, for any p, there exists infinitely many. many f such that p is split in f which is a technical condition we need for our construction and the p adic l function is a is a unit
in the Osara algebra. And this is cl classically this is a statement about producing lots of real quadratic fields where the p part of some ray class number is as small as it can possibly be. So we use that to choose our field in such a way that this term just goes away. So that, I'm taking for granted some of this, the stuff that we're still in the process of writing up, gives what um, I believe uh, Andrew Wiles had been hoping for way back in the mid-90s, a proof of the um, at least one inclusion in the Iwasawa main conjecture for the adjoint via the method of Euler systems. So I should mention, in, just in the last few minutes, that there is, a th that there is another um, way you can attack this. So a remark. Is this an alternative construction? by Skinner and San Giovanni, which also gives an Euler system for this symmetric square, using very different methods. In particular, they don't have to deal with this um, larger four-dimensional representation than getting rid of the redundant extra um, Euler factor. But um, yeah, this is also parallel work in progress. So I don't know exactly what they get. But via <laughs> either of these routes, it seems that we now have a, 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 a viable approach to um, Euler system theory for the adjoint of modular form. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. How, how relative is your approach, um, maybe it's potentially your approach, how, how relative can it be? And by that I mean instead of taking a real quadratic field of a Q, you take F a real, a real totally real field, F prime, a quadratic extension, and uh, you so, so that you would potentially get the symmetric square of a Hilbert modular form. Uh, the difficulty is to do anything like that, the input you would need would be some kind of Eisenstein type cohomology classes associated to Eisenstein series for the, um, uh, for the degree two subfield of, of, your, of, your Hilbert, uh, of your totally real field. <coughs> yes. So for the assay, or the, for the assay construction, you need an ex a quadratic extension, say, E over F. And if you have Eisenstein classes for GL2 over F, you can use this method to get information about assay representations for, G, for GL2 over E. But I think the only um, method, we ha the only approach we have for that at the moment is, the, um, is via the plectic conjectures of, um, of, ne of Jan Nekovar and Tony Scholl, which I believe give a very, very uh, beautiful picture if you assume the conjectures, but the conjectures appear to be extremely hard. So that would give a, a higher rank Euler system in this setting. Um, but, without, but without assuming any conjectures, I don't know of, any, uh, of anything you can do over larger degree fields. If you take your assay L function for two different f, you can take the ratio. And so the symmetric square is supposed to uh, go away. Can you prove the resulting identity? Um, what, the, the ratio of the two? I, think, I don't know, see a way of doing that that doesn't involve proving that the, that the missing factor is the symmetric square. And we really don't have a good way of comparing these things for different f's. Because they arise from the cohomology of essentially unrelated um, Shimura varieties. Right. Is it possible to say just like a sentence about where the cohomology classes for the assay system come from? Uh, 
sure, it's possible to say much more than a sentence. I'll try and keep it short. Um, so I mentioned um, that the assay of, that the assay representation is a direct sum and of Italco homology with some coefficients of the um, of a Hilbert modular surface. So say y is a Shimura variety for for GL2 over F. And so we have a, a natural map, the, just the diagonal inclusion GL2 over Q. Inside, yields, inside restriction of scalars of GL2 over F. And so you get some, um, some map Z into, into Y where this is a, a modular curve. And because this is a, a co-dimension one, um, a co-dimension one finite map, you get this is iota, you get some iota lower star going from h1 et al of z twist 1 to h3 et al of y twist 2. And this is, this is really y over q, and then you unwi unwind this using the hostile sayer spectral sequence to get something in h1 q h2 et al of y q bar twist two, and this you can just project onto the um, onto the cohomology of V assi. Now this is exactly the same um, as you would as you would do for the product of modular curves in the older rankin selberg construction. And in fact, we like to think of everything, all the constructions with valence and flux elements in the in the rankin selberg case as somehow the degenerate case of this new assay construction attached to the degenerate totally real field um, Q plus Q. So that's how to kind of put these in the, in the same context. So then, do you need to know, by the way, that the VSI is appearing semi-simply? Yeah. And does one? Uh, you can sort of dance around that, but it is useful to, it is useful to have it. And this was a, th a theorem that, um, that Jan proved in several recent papers, and this is something that we quote extensively in the construction. So, yes, the assay L function only determines a, 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 a unique semi-simple Galois representation, and we know that the thing ap appearing in here has the right trace, so it's isomorphic to that representation up to semi-simplification. But um, Jan proved that it is semi-simple, so it is the correct one. For P super singular, everything becomes a very great deal more difficult. <laughs> um, you, can you can construct Euler system classes for, um, for a Hilbert modular form super singular at one or more primes above P, um, but it's kind of more awkward to see how to put them in families. Uh, I mean, there there are standard methods that can be that can be applied, although it's not all been written down yet. What's much much harder is to understand the piadic assay L functions when you drop the condition either that f is ordinary at well ordinary at the prime above p corresponding to the to one distinguished pl infinite place where the weight has to be larger. So that condition, and also the condition that p be split, which is also a sort of ordinarity. And if you relax either of those, constructing the piadic L function is much, much harder. The P is a <coughs> super elliptic curve, but split for F, I mean, it seems. Um, then there ought to be something you can do, but it hasn't been done yet. But do you expect this factorization also? Um, yes, and the analogous results for the factorization of rankin selberg L functions for the symmetric square of a, of a super singular modular form. This was worked out a couple of years back by one of my PhD students, and the method should go over to, the, to this case as well. Um, in effect, it's actually easier to prove the factorization than it is to construct the periodic L function in some sense. You've, you factorize the image of the Euler system under the regulator. Yeah, it's just a special value for okay. and, and whether or not that's related to critical values is a, is a question that you don't need to answer for this, for this stage of computation. 
So if, if you define the motivic periodic L function to be just image of the Euler system under the regulator, you can factorize the motivic periodic L function without needing to know that it coincides with an analytic periodic L function. And in this super singular case, the analytic one is much harder to construct. Yeah, this, this we haven't looked at too, in too much detail yet. Although somehow for the sake of honesty, we ought to, because in the applications to Fermat's last theorem, um, Wiles really needed optimal bounds on these, uh, on these Selma groups for, um, for all elliptic curves and always for p equals 3. So we also couldn't use the usual crutch of assuming that p was really large. So um, if we actually wanted to reprove Fermat's last theorem by these methods, we would need to worry about the super singular primes. But uh, we're in a sense trying to rehabilitate the method rather than reprove the theorem. Yes. Could you say some words about the proof of LPV units? That's your own. Uh, the, what the proof uh, of the, the this re this result on the existence of the good uh, real quadratic field. Uh, I think it's actually better if I just direct you to read the paper, because these um, th these analytic averaging arguments that are used to prove methods like this are actually very far from my own expertise. So um, I don't have any more insight into that than you could gain by reading the paper yourself. I suspect uh, I can give you a precise reference, but that's uh, all I can give you. Thank you.